Good morning. What should I use to advance? Just the mouse or just the space bar? Okay. So uh, uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to uh, discuss with you today our results. As you see here the title, a population-based validation study of the DCIS score, predicting recurrence risk in individuals treated with breast-conserving surgery. Now DCIS, or ductal carcinoma in situ, is a non-invasive form of breast cancer. And it currently comprises about 30% of newly diagnosed breast cancers. Treatment is recommended because some women will go on to develop recurrent disease. Most patients with DCIS will be treated with breast conserving surgery, and this is usually followed by radiation treatment to reduce the risk of recurrence. But guidelines recommend that breast conserving surgery alone may be an option for individuals at low risk of recurrence. The challenge is that currently clinical factors and the pathological features of DCIS do not help clinicians reliably identify individuals at low risk of recurrence. So some women who are at low risk are overtreated, while others at higher risk may not be receiving um, helpful treatment. Biomarkers are needed to improve risk assessment and the management of DCIS. The Oncotype DX DCIS score is a panel of 12 genes derived from the Oncotype DX recurrence score, which is prognostic in women with early node negative invasive breast cancer. The DCIS score can be expressed as a variable from 0 to 100, but also three pre-specified risk groups have been defined. Individuals with a score less than 39 are in the low risk group. Those with a score between 39 and 54 are in the intermediate group and those with a score of 55 or higher are in the high-risk group. The DCIS score provides individualized estimates of the 10-year risk of recurrence following treatment by breast-conserving surgery alone. Now recently, the DCIS score was shown to predict local recurrence in a study called the ECOG E5194. E5194 was a prospective cohort study of highly selected individuals who were treated by breast conserving surgery alone. And in this study, they found that the DCIS score was associated with local recurrence. You can see there on the right, the individuals in the blue, the blue line represents the low risk group, and their risk of recurrence was much lower than those with intermediate or high risk scores. But it remained unclear, do these results apply to a diverse general population of women with DCIS? So that was the objective of our study, was to validate and determine if the DCIS score is associated with recurrence in a population of patients who were treated by breast conserving surgery alone. <coughs> and our main findings were that it is. The DCIS score was associated with the risk of recurrence and the risk of developing invasive local recurrence. The DCIS score provides independent and individualized information on recurrence risk. We evaluated our, the DCIS score in a population of women diagnosed with DCIS in Ontario from 1994 to 2003 and confirmed they were treated by breast conserving surgery alone and had clear margins. And here are our results. Again, in blue you see the risk of recurrence in individuals in the low risk group, which was about 12.7% at 10 years, and significantly lower than those who had intermediate or high risk scores. You see here that individuals, again, in the low risk group in blue, had a lower risk of invasive local recurrence and a lower risk of DCIS local recurrence compared to those in the intermediate and high risk group. And they were both statistically significant. So in conclusion, our study shows that the DCIS score is associated with the risk of local recurrence and invasive local recurrence in a population of patients with pure DCIS treated by breast conserving surgery alone. Our results show that the score is predictive in a general population of, DC, of women with DCIS, and it's the first multi-gene biomarker assay in DCIS that can provide individualized estimates of the risk of recurrence in women who were treated by breast conserving surgery alone. This can help clinicians and patients make more informed decisions about their own risks of local recurrence and better understand the potential benefits of treatment. And hopefully this can lead to improvements in the management of DCIS by reducing overtreatment for those at low risk 
and reducing under-treatment for those at higher risk of recurrence. Thank you. So um, let me ask the first question. Eileen, I, I'm assuming that um, since the study was done quite some time ago that none of these patients received tamoxifen prevention afterward for ER positive BCIS, is that right? Well, very few. So we had data on tamoxifen usage in women over 65. We were unable to obtain data on the compliance of tamoxifen or on the use of tamoxifen in younger women. But you're right, tamoxifen usage, particularly uh, in the time period of this study for DCIS, was very uncommon. So these re results really do apply to women who did not receive tamoxifen. So the extrapolation might be then that in the era where tamoxifen is used as a prevention, so to speak, in patients with ER positive DCIS, your recurrence rates would be even lower, um, I'm, I'm assuming, and therefore even provide a greater measure of safety in patients who don't receive radiation therapy, for instance? Well, I, I think that the uh, effect of tamoxifen is beyond the scope of our particular study, but what our study does show is that the DCIS score can provide individualized estimates for, of the risk of recurrence, and that can help clinicians, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and surgeons better understand the risk, and women to understand their risks, and then discuss in a more informed way what the potential benefit of radiation and tamoxifen might be. I think, it, let me just say one thing about, D, people get confused about DCIS because it has the word cancer in it. Patients get confused, doctors get confused. Many people don't even consider it a cancer. It's a precancerous lesion. There's been several discussions over the past decade about renaming it to be something less. Because it has the name cancer in it, we tend to treat it more aggressively when many of these patients probably don't need any treatment at all. Just the problem is we can't identify them, and this is one of the first steps to show that we can start backing off on treatment in some of these patients. Question? Yes. If, um, if, can you further improve the predictability of this test if you also combine it with age and the grade of the, of the DCIS? I mean, that, that's, <clears throat> pardon me, that's an excellent question. The next step is to integrate the DCIS score with existing known risk factors such as age. So we do plan to do that. Uh, Ed Sussman with the uh, Oncology Times. Um, the, the, chart, the curves that you showed seem to show almost no difference between intermediate and high-risk individuals. When you put intermediate, the term intermediate in there, it gives people more leeway in what they want to do. Um, do you really, is there really a need in, in this score for an intermediate grade? It, it doesn't look like it makes much difference. Well, our group was not involved in actually defining the score. The objective of our study was to evaluate if the score as it was defined by genomic health and in the first E5194 study was associated with recurrence. So we didn't know when we started our analysis if there would be a significant difference. And our, power, our study was empowered to show the difference, but you're right, the curves look very similar. So going forward, it really is for genomic health and others to determine whether there needs to be the three groups or the two groups. But for our purpose, we wanted to evaluate all three groups as was previously defined. Oh, uh, thank you. Elaine Shatner, Forbes contributor. Uh, this is fascinating work. Thank you. I have a question. Can you comment on the positive uh, predictive value of a high score versus the predictive value for a lack of recurrence of a low score? That is, does the, do the two um, more separate score result it, it, between those is one more effective than the other? Can women more safely decline treatment? based on a low score as opposed to taking treatment, you know, or safely, it's not the right word, um, but is the high or the low score more predictive? I, I th if I understand your question, I think um, you're maybe to some extent talking about the impact of treatment, which again, we can't uh, determine. I think the best way to think about the use of this in, in a clinical practice or from a woman's perspective, that if this score can help uh, tell an individual what her risk of recurrence is. If it's 10 percent or 30 percent, depending on the score group, then that's informative to the clinician and to the patient. 
they could then discuss with their oncologist what the potential benefit of treatment might be or the need for any further treatment. So I'm not sure I'm exactly answering what you're asking. Forgive me, in terms of the prediction of a low, of a low score predicting a lack of recurrence or a high score predicting that it will recur. Well, that's exactly what we did. So in the, we identified the cohort, we got tissue, measured their score, and then we did see how well the score, categorized by low, intermediate, and high, was associated with recurrence. And so that's the, what our study does is further validate in a more general population of women that the score, in fact, is predictive, both the low and the high. Can you just um, explain again how the two different I'm populations um, differ between the ECOG E5194 and your study? Oh, so I'm sorry. I couldn't see who was speaking. Can you repeat your question? Sorry. Um, yes. Can you explain the difference in the study populations between the ECOG E5194 and your study? Yes. Again? So the ECOG E5194 was a prospective cohort study. And when we refer to it as highly selected individuals, women had to have nuclear grade one or two less than two and a half centimeters or nuclear grade three less than one centimeter with clear margins of at least three millimeters. So they were selected. The, the DCIS cohort in Ontario, we identified all women in the province who were treated by breast conserving surgery alone and, and, oh, and confirmed their surgery, confirmed their pathology, but it did include women with larger tumor size or smaller margins. It was more diverse than the women who participated in the clinical trial. Uh, hi, uh, Neil Osterweil with Medscape. Uh, just a question, about, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Rakovich, that uh, treatment is recommended, but under whose guidelines? Uh, what are the, because as Dr. Osborne said, it's somewhat controversial. Um, what do the various <coughs> guidelines say about treating DCIS? Exactly as Dr. Osborne mentioned, DCIS is associated with very high survival rates. But the general guidelines, national guidelines, recommend still that uh, women be treated at least with local excision, what we refer to as breast conserving surgery. The addition of radiation treatment, most women will have radiation treatment, partly because we can't identify the subset at wim of women at low risk. So we hope that this will help further improve that. But most women have at least surgical excision, and there is controversy or debate of the need of additional surgery beyond that. Um, Alice, last question, then we'll be okay. Okay. I don't know. It's on. Uh, Alice Goodman with the ASCO Post. I know you're a Canadian, but is this, the, for the American oncologists on the panel, is this likely to be approved for reimbursement, and who pays for it? It sounds like it helps the woman more than the doctor. not an expert on reimbursement, but, you know, Oncotype uh, has been approved. Uh, people seem to get reimbursement for the, uh, for the assay for colorectal cancer, and that assay, as opposed to Oncotype for breast cancer, actually increases the number of people that have treatment. So I don't know the ins and outs of it, but the colon cancer assays suggest that that isn't a major factor as whether it's going to reduce an intervention or not. I think uh, with two studies like this, the reimbursement agencies are probably going to do it because it saves them money. Uh, the test, I don't know how much this particular test co uh, cost, but radiation therapy is pretty expensive. And if you can save patients from having an expensive therapy and it's just as good in terms of their long-term outcome, it's likely to be reimbursed. But I'm not an expert in that area either. John? Yeah. I think the point I'd make is this gives the patient and the doctor more information it doesn't say that you can withdraw treatment. You have to prove that. So it identifies patients who would be at low risk. And then if you're going to withdraw radiation therapy, you've got to prove that that actually works, I think. So it's, it's helpful for the patient, but I think you still have to prove the value of the test in clinical practice. Right. It doesn't uh, say anything about the impact of treatment, exactly. but we do know that it provides more accurate and individualized estimates that can then better inform clinicians and patients about the potential benefits of treatment. Okay. 